family. Wow, Dr. Sarah Brand, what an incredible lady. Listen, I'm such a fangirl for her and you're gonna be as well. She's one of the founding partners of True Wealth Ventures. There's some stuff she's done that, that is amazing. Let me just share with you what she says. She's worked directly for three Fortune Global 500 CEOs in both strategic and operational capacities. She led a $300 million plus acquisition through integration into a $5 billion plus company to leading the new business unit. She led integration program management of a $5 billion plus acquisition to realize 400 million plus in cost synergies and She's managed a $100 million leading Silicon Valley venture capital fund with four other investment professionals. I mean, the list just goes on and on right up to a microbrewery. I'm so excited for you to meet her and enjoy her wisdom. Um, come on, let's start with Dr. Sarah Brand. I'm her new fangirl. Sarah, welcome, or I should say Dr. Sarah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm so impressed. You're the founding general partner of an incredible VC fund with a lot of accolades. I am so excited to talk with you today. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Well, look, your firm True Wealth Ventures is an early stage VC fund, and you guys invest in women-led businesses in consumer health and sustainability uh, sectors. That's a lot. So right now, before we even get into the story of you and what you're doing, will you define for us exactly what all this means, and in particular, um, how VC funds work? Sure. Yes, there are a lot of ways to get financial support to grow businesses. There's um, equity and non-equity ways. Non-equity ways being, you know, loans primarily, grants, etc. Um, equity is a different forms as well. It can be public equity, which is what gets most of the press with, you know, companies that are traded on the Fortune 500 or Nasdaq, etc. Oh, then there's private equity. And that's what venture capital is contained within of getting, um, we invest in companies for shares of the companies, but they're privately held. And venture capital within private equity tends to be earlier stage. Now that's changed a lot over the last you know, decade, I'd say, and even the last just handful of years. Um, but what we do is we invest very early stage at the seed, S-E-E-D level. So generally, if a company is really high growth, um, looks at being, you know, first to market, growing really, really quickly into the, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue in a five to seven year kind of time frame, that's the type of company hyper growth that is a good fit for venture capital. And those types of companies usually will do a first kind of internal rounds like friends and family, um, angel groups. Uh, angels are individuals that are wealthy and invest directly in companies at very early stages with smaller checks generally. And then seed stage venture capital firms come in as the first kind of institutional professional investors, because it's not my money, I'm investing on behalf of my investors' money. And so that's the seed stage, sort of the first institutional rounds. The average rounds in this country are three and a half million dollars of seed stage venture capital rounds to give you a, you know, a sense of how big these, these are. And so that's, um, that's what we do. We invest at that stage. Our first checks for our fund one were $500,000. Usually that was average in these rounds and uh, we're in fund two now and uh, those checks are up to a million dollars. So I can go into more detail on all that, but that's generally what we do. Well, it's really exciting because one of the things that you pay attention to is investing in women-led businesses. And we talked about that being in consumer health and sustainability sectors. Mm -hmm. What is a sustainability sector? 
Sure, we actually made up the term of uh, sustainable consumer as a market. So I do need to explain that <laughs> because it's not out there in the world. <laughs> so um, we looked at the fact, our investment premise is that women led companies do better financially period across the board, whether it's fortune 500 companies or small venture capital backed startups or- We learned that through the work I do at Harvard with women owned businesses in Africa and they repay loans quickly. Yes. They give return and yield quicker. I yes. don't know what's under that, but please tell us. Yes. And the other great thing about it is when women come into wealth by growing their you know, business, they, there's a, a term that Goldman Sachs coined called the gender dividend. And then they reinvest 80% of that wealth into their community, into their health, into their family. So it's the quickest, most efficient, best way to build up any community, whether it's, you know, in Africa or if it's in Austin. We need to pay attention to that in COVID right now, don't we? Coming out of COVID. Absolutely. Um, Um, You know, I love the term that you uh, created, though. That's just awesome. And you're leading this $150 million venture fund with four partners you guys have been named one of the top 10 uh, VC firms for adding uh, to the portfolio companies. I just really, that's so awesome. Tell us about this. Well, it's um, its actually me and uh, Carrie Rupp are the two general partners. So we're the full-time investment decision makers, the investment committee. Then we have some advisors. Um, so it's really just the two of us. And um and I just wanted to loop back really quickly too on the on our uh, focus for women, uh, why we're focusing on women, um, because, well, uh, there there's several reasons in our market. So women are like I was saying, you know, absolutely financially outperform no matter whether it's big money or small loans. Um, but we invest in these particular markets of what we're calling sustainable consumer and consumer health. So companies improving environmental or human health with some kind of consumer or patient pull through of that technology, that service, Um, because women are making 85% of all consumer purchase decisions and 80% of all healthcare decisions. And so we think gender diverse teams, you know, perform better in whatever market they play in, but we think in these particular markets of, sustainable consumer, consumer health, they'll even outperform more than average because gender diverse teams have an advantage of understanding those customer and market needs better because they're in those markets, making all the decisions, seeing what products are available, what, you know, needs are not being met. They understand the go-to-market, the, you know, how to service those customers more efficiently because they are the customer. So that's why we're focused there. I think it's brilliant. Hey, look, I'm a, I'm a fan. I, I, I'm such a fan of yours anyway. As I as I learn more about you, I just get m- so incredibly enthusiastic about what your gift to the world is uh, in terms of how you're helping women. You actually, Dr. Sarah, have a PhD. It's in green design and manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And then you minored in public health and energy. Yes. And then you got a management uh, degree in tech certification uh, in technology from Berkeley. Okay, that's a whole lot. How did that happen? (laughs) Well, you know, it started back, I got my, I got three degrees in mechanical engineering. So I got my undergrad mechanical engineering at UT Austin. And I was actually quite disturbed by how the engineering, you know, school was, teaching our engineers of here's a problem statement. Now, what type of metal should we start selecting to you know, solve this problem? I'm like, wait a second, there's a humongous problem space between a problem statement and what metal should we select to machine. <laughs> and that's a, like an environmental catastrophe if that's how we're training people. So I really started getting interested in how do we train our engineers to think about how to solve you know, the world's problems but not doing damage to environmental or human health or really wow. minimizing that. So there's this particular lab in UC Berkeley called the Green Design and Manufacturing Lab. And I went there to study that, you know, and create, and I ended up creating an environmental value analysis um, that really took into consideration the trade-offs between cost and performance and environmental and human health at those early design stages. Well, how did your PhD focus get you to here? 
Yes. So, (laughs) (laughs) right. Because I was really focused in very technical roles at big companies in the mainly semiconductor and electronics markets like Intel and applied materials. And um, then completely shifted gears and went into management consulting. So I ended up working at McKinsey and Company out in their San Francisco office within the semiconductor industry. Well, you know, most of the clients that I worked with were in the semiconductor industry. So I was familiar with the, you know, industry, even though the work I was doing was totally non-technical. It was strategic management consulting. But I realized whether companies implemented the um, environmental value analysis that I was developing was really more of a business decision than a technical decision. And so I really wanted to make an impact ultimately. And so I wanted to learn how businesses thought, how management decisions were really made. So I went and did management consulting for a while and then went into venture capital because I didn't want to lose my technical background actually. And so VC is the perfect blend of the two worlds for me because I'm meeting with entrepreneurs all the time, learning about their great ideas, their technical solutions and, you know, designs, and still I can wear my management consulting hat and help them with a myriad of businesses challenges. So it's a real great blend of the two. Let's go really elementary. What is an early stage VC fund and how does it serve the 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 entrepreneur how does it work Mm -hmm. right it's um you know that takes different flavors but i would say (laughs) (laughs) um you can get capital from anywhere and now it's hard sometimes but um the venture capitalist really should be more than the money it should like when we invest, we like to lead the deal. So that means we actually structure the deal. We write the term sheet and then, you know, the guidelines. And then we usually take a board position. And because we're investing at the early stage, half the time we're developing the board. There's not even a board yet. So we're forming a board of directors and really helping that founding team or the founder with how do they scale this business from hiring to future you know rounds of venture capital financing um, to business strategy you know you name it so it really should be um, a partnership and a lot of people talk about it like it's like a marriage because it's takes a while to get from the very early stage to a successful exit and that is you know there's bound to be ups and downs. Even if everything goes as well as it is, it could seem to on paper, there's going to be some serious issues along the way. And so um, really finding somebody who can, who you can be, you know, talk to very transparently, who can be an effective coach for you as a, you know, entrepreneur, um, it's a lot more than money. So I, I was just about to say, you know, many, many people think of going VC as really going for the money, but it's really a way to go for the market. Many of our um, listeners are early stage entrepreneurs. How do they know when it's time to go VC? Mm -hmm. For the vast majority of companies, um, I'd say venture capital isn't a great path because those VCs are looking for humongous returns on their investment. So they're looking for an exit within a relatively short time frame. So exits can be an IPO, which is pretty rare. Um, um, most exits happen via acquisition or maybe a bigger private equity firm buying the company. Um, but usually it's like in, in our world, um, the markets in which we invest are very acquisitive. So we're looking at uh, big brands, usually, you know, big companies uh, buying these smaller companies, especially in the sustainability and health area where a consumer consumers are looking for cleaner and greener solutions. And so these big brands need to adopt those. So, um, so that's an exit. So it has to be those, those entrepreneurs need to um, really want to sell their company within a, t- a, a relatively short time frame. Um, venture capitalists usually don't get excited until the valuation is at a hundred million plus. And some of them don't get excited unless it literally can be a billion dollar opportunity. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. unless you as an entrepreneur really want to grow really quickly, really big, and then sell your company or, you know, go public, it's not a great path. If it's more of a lifestyle business or, um, 
you know, you want to be able to run it for a long, long time and you don't want to you know, sell it, that, then that's that venture capital isn't the right path for you because they are looking for an exit. So is, is there anything in particular that an entrepreneur needs to do to get VC ready? Yes. In fact, there are more and more um, accelerators or incubators, they're called, to do just that, to um, when somebody has a great idea um, or even like a early um, proof of concept or minimally viable product or what, you know, it, it can be very, very early from a, literally an idea on a napkin to something that, you know, works, but they just don't know how to get it to market. Um, there are ex accelerators that you can apply to and they will kind of put fuel on the fire in terms of legal resources, marketing resources, you know, strategy, but uh, get you ready to, well, to even see if the idea is viable, to see, um, and, and there's lots of customer interviews and, you know, changing the strategy up and seeing if it even sticks and, and or, you know, what, what really works and then getting you ready to pitch it in front of investors. And sometimes it's in front of more angel, you know, level investors. Sometimes it's in front of, of venture capitalists. It depends what, you know, accelerator, but more and more there are those programs for you know, early stage entrepreneurs looking at this as a path um, and more and more for women entrepreneurs or underrepresented, um, you know, in general entrepreneurs. So because I, I was just gonna say they have different challenges sometimes. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that. Um, I jumped in to assist a friend who was running an accelerator program out of uh, Irvine. And it was just amazing to see these entrepreneurs and uh, the passion and the brilliance that they bring to the table. Um, in this industry, both on your side of the table and on the entrepreneurial side of the table, how are women doing? Not great. I, I really don't like to say that it's not great because I don't feel like it's motivating. Um, but the numbers are not happy. Um, <laughs> so the numbers are happy in terms of the financial outperformance. So there has been study after study starting in about 2014, 2013, where there were just a few studies. Now it's just multiple, multiple, multiple data points showing that women-led venture capital-backed companies see significantly higher financial outperformance. Um, the latest study that we quote all the time, just because it was you know hundreds and hundreds of companies, um, showed that women-led VC-backed companies raised 45% less capital, yet saw 2.5x greater returns. It's just outstanding just you know, shocking that it can even be such a difference. Yet the percent of VC dollars going to women entrepreneurs, women-led companies, has been hovering between like two and three percent over the last decade, and now it just went down in early 21. It's 1.6 percent. Now it's just creeped back up to 1.8 percent. But it's like less than two percent of VC dollars are going to women-led companies. It's not rational. You know, it's are, are women not seeking VC? Why is this? I mean, that no. is one of the most disparate outcomes or data points that I've heard about anything, including COVID. I know it's gotten worse during COVID. The thought of why it's gotten worse. I mean, it's gone from really bad to even worse. So I didn't even, to even talk about that small difference, maybe is irrelevant. But the thought is, and it, which is indicative of the whole ecosystem being broken is that it's already very, very insular. And it got even more insular during COVID where people weren't able to go to the conferences and meet people they wouldn't otherwise meet. And so they were really just investing in the networks they knew, which is generally people that look and, you know, act like them and have gone to the same schools, gone to the same country clubs, gone, you know, their colleagues know them, whatever. So if it's not people they already know, it's like people that they really relate to. Um, because they understand them because it's familiar. And I think that's the issue with venture capital is that it's um, early stage investing where there's not tons of data or it's not just a financial decision. A lot of it is a little bit more art. And uh, so you kind of have to go with your gut a bit. And when there's people that don't feel familiar to you, it, it makes sense why those mainly 
older white men in Silicon Valley wouldn't feel feel comfortable investing in somebody that they don't get. That's just not, you know, that, that nobody in their ecosystem is, they've been friends with, or they've known that kind of person. And so it's just not comfortable. That plus the markets, right? The women entrepreneurs are usually actually solving a real pain point that they have, or that somebody in their family has. And so um, those tend to be in areas that are not enterprise software SaaS or you know what I mean it's yeah, like right right <laughs> yeah but and, it's a big point you make about where we tend to focus on business and 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 solving those problems uh, did you grow up in Texas you went to university first where, where did you grow up I mean was there a mentor for you growing up early on or did all of this this stuff happen as a consequence of as you said sitting in an engineering class and wondering why aren't me thinking about the universe as we, you know, solve <laughs> with metal. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think there was. I mean, my dad was a mechanical engineer, so I think that's why it was um, in my, you know, conscience or whatever to go study that. And I just wanted to learn how things worked and how things were made. So it just seemed sort of a natural thing. Were you through. ever a tinkerer? No, not at all. In fact, I can't fix anything. Thank God my <laughs> husband's also a mechanical engineer. And I'm like, you're the man. <laughs> you go fix it. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm more uh, conceptual and uh, uh, strategic. That's what I say. <laughs> well, how do you connect everything you're doing back to family? I mean, because we talked on the one hand about women looking to solve big challenges and, and jumping in to do that entrepreneurially, mm -hmm. women also still in to a great degree, we're told, are responsible for how the family and the community operates. You yourself mentioned women are investing back into communities and companies. So um, how, how do you tie all of that together for yourself? Well, um, it's a good question. I say one thing is I look at balance over a lifetime, not over a day or a week or any short period of time or else I go crazy. Uh, You're trusting in tomorrow, Dr. Sarah. You're trusting in tomorrow. <laughs> totally. I have two boys and um, my whole world has been very male. That's another reason why I'm doing what I'm doing as, you know, being a mechanical engineer and then, you know, in semiconductors and in venture capital. And my husband and I started a brewery actually when we moved back to Austin from the Bay Area. And it's, you know, all men, unfortunately, <laughs> that we employ um, at the moment. So it's just been very male and I have two boys. So this was um, uh, this anyway, it, it's um, it's been fantastic to work with women because it's not something I've been able to do for the rest of my career. Um, but I mean, how I I would say uh, maybe a different twist on your answering your question is that I'm on the board of um or the executive committee of the College of Engineering for UT Austin and I'm actually the mechanical engineering board for UC Berkeley's uh, school. And they have been really one of the, some of the top public engineering schools to attract and award the most engineering degrees to women. And so uh, I worked with them over time of how do we get more women to apply and how do we get more women to, you know, stay here and, and graduate. And the way that we found to do that is to use even different language of create versus make and, you know, some subtle things, but they generally don't care about the starting salaries. They don't care about the shiny, cool, you know, machine shop tools or anything like that. They want to know how do I go solve this problem, which tends to be in, in environmental or human health. Like they have a mission. They already have something that, you know, they've seen their, you know, mom or their grandmother had cancer or you know they're um really upset about some climate change element or you know whatever it might be they are on a mission to solve a problem and they want to know what other alumni have done in the world to make a positive impact and so i think it's you know because women i said had made, are making 80 percent of healthcare decisions you know to bring it back to the family they're making their own decisions but themselves that often for their children, for their spouses, often for their aging parents, their parents in law. And so, you know, they see the issues, they have an advantage of, of knowing what is needed, and even how to make that um, solution a reality. 
And so I guess that's kind of how I tie it back to the family is women um, have this advantage perspective by being the healthcare decision makers, by having to buy all the groceries generally and go address the family issues and, uh, you know, buy all the clothes and just all that. That's usually the role that woman in the, you know, family takes. And so then they get to see all of these, all of these um, opportunities. Um, so anyway, that's how I like to think about balancing, you know, family with, with work is how do you have all these unique perspectives of how to solve the world's problems? That's kind of, I mean, it's true across industries for women. Uh, Dr. Kismikia Corbett, a strong developer for the Moderna vaccine. It was very personal for her. Yeah. And it was very personal for her before COVID. And I think that's why she was able to step out so strongly with the Moderna vaccination. So, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're sharing some things that really merit a lot of study. You also, though, worked in uh, mergers and acquisitions. I did, yes. When, uh, so when I went into venture capital, I loved the work. It was just what I wanted it to be. And I wanted to do it long-term, but I also wanted to get more operational experience. I hadn't run a business before. I had worked in big Fortune 500 companies. I had um, you know, done management consulting, but I realized in order to be that great venture capitalist I was telling you about, there should be a lot more than money. Mm -hmm. They should be mm -hmm. helping you run the business. I realized I needed to go get more operational experience. So I had a great opportunity to work directly uh, with the CEO of Advanced Micro Devices, big semiconductor company in Sunnyvale. They're headquartered there, but he actually sat in Austin and all the leadership sat in Austin. So it was a great way for me to get back to Austin. And um, I spent a little over 10 years there and got a lot more operational experience, frankly, than what I intended to do. I ran several business units and um, did a lot of strategy uh, work and did a lot of um, M&A work. So which was great for venture capital in that it was the other side of the venture capital you know, equation. I was buying these small VC backed companies and integrated them into the big company. So it's a great perspective to have when you're thinking about how do you help grow a company to make it attractive to that potential acquirer. Mm, but listen, I got to ask you this, okay? You, you're, you're also the co-founder of, uh, of uh, what is it, 512 Brewing? Yep. And I understand it's the largest draught-only self-distributing microbrewery in the country. How did that happen? I mean, you're, <laughs> listen, now, now, listen to it from where I'm sitting, okay? <laughs> you grew up with a dad who was a mechanical engineer. So that influenced you. You went to engineering school, but you didn't like what they were teaching you because it just wasn't environmentally sound and thoughtful. And so you went off to figure out how do we make it environmentally soft, uh, thoughtful. And on the way, you became a tech expert and you're doing all of this stuff where you see little to no women and you achieve and get there and then bang 512 brewery that's what we're hearing i think tie that up for us kudos to you i'm bowing down i'm bowing down. <laughs> I would say it's more bang true all ventures, but um, what <laughs> happened is my husband was an avid microbrewer. So actually we met as undergrads at UT engineering in thermodynamics class, very romantic. And then um, <laughs> we run a senior design project together and um, our third um, engineering colleague, or whatever, made beer. And uh, so he, so my husband was like enamored and, um, and learned how to make beer in undergraduate, went to Berkeley and uh, it got to the, I was traveling all the time with my, you know, consulting gig. And so I was up there during the week. So I had very little say, literally got to the point where he took out all the shelves in our refrigerator and just had two kegs. So our produce and everything had to fit like in the door. So it was just a little much, um, but he was, you know, really brewing a lot of beer. When we moved back to Austin, there were no microbreweries left practically. There was, you know, two, I guess, being generous. But when we were in undergraduate school, there were so many, you know, microbreweries in Austin. It was a sort of a, I don't know, mecca for it. Um, so he start, He was in biomedical startups. 
uh, he started dreaming and designing his gris case at work. And so I was like, hold on, let's think about whether there's an opportunity to start a business here because there's a demand. There was no Indian pale ale IPA. That's my favorite style at all in Austin. And so that was a real problem. <clears throat> and um, he started making in the business model, you know, at, on um, weekends and, you know, evenings, and we were looking at it, we're like, this makes a lot of sense. And it's something that he'd always thought maybe he'd do in retirement. But I thought, let's do it now, because we can recover from it if it doesn't work out. If we do this in retirement, not only will we be tired and <laughs> a lot older, but, um, it, you know, it's harder to recover from. So he ended up um, I went back to work from my first maternity leave and he stayed home. So I told the nanny that I just hired, I told you nobody was going to be here, but now my husband's going to be, you know, just <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, so anyway, he started the brewery, um, uh, right when we had our first child and, um, and it's really his baby. Um, but you know, we obviously both own it and I help with a little bit of a management consulting <laughs> when he allows me to. <laughs> well, that's so cool. You know, in my hometown, Chalmers, North Carolina, very small southern town, and uh, Inez and her husband, uh, Stephen uh, Rivestello, have Chalmers Brewing Company, and they actually met in New York and moved back to North Carolina. I think Inez moved mainly because, you know, when 9-11 happened, that was pretty crude for everybody. Uh, and she wanted a place for her children to enjoy where she had grown up as well. I can't speak for her. I'm a neighbor to her. I get that vibe from her. But yeah. my whole thing about that is that these brewers are coming from very different disciplines all across the place. I mean, she and Stephen own a restaurant called On the Square, and people come from outside of that small town to experience food there. COVID mm -hmm. certainly impacted it, but their decision to give health to the world is very aligned with you. And I mm -hmm. think it was somewhere in your DNA that you may have ended up there now as I think about it, because you wanted healthy metals, you want healthy tech. You want mm -hmm. healthy opportunities for women. There's a lot of justice based in how you work. And um, I I think that's part of why I'm such a fangirl for you, doctor. <laughs> I'm just such a fangirl for you. Um, I do want to uh, go into four for four because okay. I know we have limited time and I can hardly wait to hear. So I'm gonna ask you four questions and you're gonna give me four answers. Your answers have to be identified with why they are the answers. The first question I'm leaning in to listen very carefully on is you get to host a dinner and you're hosting this dinner for any four people from any period of time, present, back. Don't give us future people because with that brilliant mind of yours, we can't <laughs> follow that far. But anybody alive or transitioned, who's at your table and why? Wow, I get four people? You get four people. Same dinner party or I could have like- Same a dinner party. I love yeah. your brain. <laughs> Do you know, no one has asked me, is it the same dinner party or can I have a one-on-one? -on -one? And I think that's so hot for a woman to ask that because you care about how they mix with each other and what right. that dinner is going to be like. It also allows you to maximize your time with them if it's one-on-one. -on -one. But right. this is a dinner with four people and you're hosting the dinner. Okay. You can have the dinner for as long as you want. Okay, great. Yeah, I can catch somebody after dessert just in the kitchen alone. Um, well, okay, the two people that come to mind right away, and I don't know who the other two people are, but I mean, hopefully it'll come to me, is Mary Magdalene. I am just, there's more and more coming out about, you know, how much has changed or, or you know, whatever, not written and rewritten. And I just love to hear the facts. I mean, can you imagine being able to hear her perspective? So that you know, I've had so many people want Jesus and nobody asked Mary to come, uh, Mary Magdalene to come. Nah, you gotta <laughs> ask Mary for the straight facts, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so that would be amazing. Um, I also think Melinda Gates, and I'm reading her book now, Moment of Lift, and so she's on my mind a lot, but she's been such an advocate for, you know, women's empowerment and, um, and how that part of the solution she sees is actually the lack of women in venture capital in the United States and that there's this trickle down kind of, you know, effect as if you can, um, and I just figured out one of my other ones. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I would love to um, hear, I'd rather have one-on-one -on -one dinners, but she would love Mary Magdalene too. So it's fine. Um, and then the Dalai Lama, because uh, he actually said that the Western woman is going to save the world. And I agree. I think that um, it's going to be through, you know, some of this dynamic of women are estimated to control two thirds of US investable assets by 2030. They're largely not investing in venture capital today, as you can imagine, with, uh, you know, very few investment decision makers being women in venture capital, like myself, very few women getting the venture capital dollars. There's not a lot of women in that ecosystem investing in you know, these funds either. So I'm a real proponent of getting more women educated about the importance of investing in women entrepreneurs and investing in this innovation ecosystem. And I think that because of the gender dividend, when women come into wealth as entrepreneurs, as investors of, you know, into those entrepreneurs, they reinvest that money back into the community, back into other women, you know, and build it up. And so I think that's kind of where the Dalai Lama was getting at. So I'd love to hear more about what he really was saying and um, he'd be invited to the party. Um, and then I guess I'd have to have my husband just because. Oh, nobody yeah. else has brought their spouse. That's so cool. I wait, I'm wondering if my friend Kim brought hers, but anyway, this is awesome. <laughs> Why? Why is he coming? Uh, just because it'd be so not nice to leave him out of something like that, <laughs> right? Oh my God. Oh my God. That's so to come. Otherwise I'd give his ticket to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, with that uh, guest that, uh, list that you've got, I'm going to go there and help you serve that dinner. Okay. Yes. So I can, so I can be in on it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Let's go two for four. Okay. What four books do you recommend to our family of listeners and why? Mm. Um, gosh, I don't know if I'm going to get the name right. One of my favorites um, is, I think it's called the Athena Doctrine. And it's mm -hmm. about how handwriting um, changed our culture to a patriarchal culture from a feminine kind of culture. And it is the most interesting book I that I've read probably in the last, I don't know, five years at least. It's insane. Um, anyway, the guy who wrote it is, is so smart and I don't even know how he came up with this theory, but he's got so many data points to back it up. It's riveting. Um, I'm reading right now, Homo Deus. Which is the doctrine. Uh, is that by John Gers Gersima? I believe Gersima, so. How women and the men who think like them will rule the future. Is that what it's about? It talks about how feminine values can solve our toughest problems and build a more prosperous future. Mm, no, I don't I'm so. really interested in that the handwriting one. <laughs> I, I'm really interested in the handwriting one. Yes. Um, I think I'm going to have to look it up to make sure, but I don't think that's it because I don't think it would say that in the um, summary. It's about handwriting specifically and he goes through different religions different times different cultures and talks about how things um went to the shitter as soon as <laughs> <laughs> so it's a theme something i think um i can look that up i'll look that up um and then, gosh, well, so I think that's, that's very uh, interesting to think about um, how, how culture has framed this patriarchal, um, you know, society. And it's, so it's, it's good to know. <laughs> um, books. I mean, there's books like by Brad Feld about being smarter than your 
you're a lawyer and you're a venture capitalist for women entrepreneurs that are, you, you know. You want to teach women how to be smarter than you? <laughs> yes. When, you know uh, what? I'm not <laughs> just fangirling now over here. Oh my God, I can hardly wait until we're through COVID and I get the chance to say hello to you face to face. You're, you're one of the top 10 people on my list who I want to connect with. Your brain is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, What's our third book? Um, gosh. What's our third book? I don't know. I'm not thinking. I've just been, I've been reading lots of trash books. Um. <laughs> yeah, give us some of those. See how you go from uh, from how handwriting <laughs> women impact the world and it became a male dominant society when we moved to it to now let's enjoy some trash. I love that. But then you did tell us early on, doctor, you said um, that when you look at life balance, it's not about 50 50. And that's so me. So maybe right. that's that connection. Uh, but what's the trash book? Are there well, two of them? Not trash. I'm just, I've been enjoying, um, oh gosh, what's it even called? There's a whole TV series on it now. Uh, I'm so bad at, at recommending books. Um, I can't even remember. Oh, The Outlanders? Out the Out oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I love that because it's like historical fiction where, mm -hmm. you know, she's in um, Scotland and then. Uh, anyway, you know, in the before the revolution in I think North Carolina, actually. <laughs> um, anyway, I love the and she's a doctor, and so you get this um, I don't know this perception of what it would be like to live at that time with the uh, of course women's right. Like the author wrote it. There's well, anyway, I won't go into detail, but I, I've been enjoying that because of the historical fiction aspect. Um, in the third. I'm listening right now to Homo Deus, which is a really interesting. Um, uh, and and so I, it's a brief history of tomorrow. And so it's it's really going back to um, you know how we've evolved as Homo sapiens and and with technology, you know, um, accelerating so quickly. What does that mean for now that we're up Maslow's hierarchy? What, mm -hmm. what are we going to act like as a culture? Um, so that's really interesting. I don't know if I'd recommend it yet because I'm only halfway through. <laughs> I'll put it as my fourth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We are transitioning to three for four, right? We're going three okay. for four. And you kind of led us there. What are the who are the four artists you're listening to? Oh man. Um, well, uh, I listen to Alt J a lot music wise. I love that. Um, last week, what did I, I'm, I'm so bad at remembering names of things. I went to a oh, Krung bin. It's impossible to, um, pronounce or spell it's K H R U A N G B I N, but they're a band uh, in Houston. Are they Germany? Are they German? No, they're influenced by like Thai Hindu music and Spanish music, and but they're like psychedelic rock. It's very unusual. I and have I to it. write. I have to write that one down. Let's spell it again. I love it. A okay. um, yes, K H. R U A N G R U A N G B I N B I N Crime A woman man, well, it, it the a woman bassist who is one of the best bassists. I've she really plays it like a lead guitar. Like it's amazing. And then uh, wow. anyway, three-person band, really interesting, very unique sound. I love them. Um that's who I'm mainly listening to right now, uh, them and all J. And I just, you know, Pandora's changed my life. I just go to like Alt J Station, Krungbin Station, then it just plays, and I love the music, but I don't know who it is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh no, I love this. Who's that? Never heard of them. So 
I'm a little guilty of that as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really did. It really did change things up. Okay, want to go four for four? And if yes, you think please. of two more, you just text them to me, okay? okay. I'll share them on social media. Okay. Um, so four for four. Uh, what four pieces of advice have been given you over your life that you think would be phenomenal to share with people listening right now? Please also, in addition to telling why, would you share who gave it to you if that's, if that's possible? Sure. <clears throat> well, I know uh, my research advisor at Berkeley, when I was getting my PhD, uh, I did very well on my qualifying exams for being accepted into the program. And um, I did so well that he said, you know what, this is nothing to be proud of. You actually should just pass. The smartest person should just pass. But the fact that you studied so much and, you know, got like a perfect score, that's not the smartest strategy. And I, that was very good advice for me because I was such a dot every I cross every T perfectionist that it changed my frame of reference of that's not the smartest thing to do to get all the answers right. The smartest thing to do is just get it up that you pass because especially at that point, all the years and year ratios and some of the silly things that I had to learn for my qualifying, I was never going to use that, never use it, you know, never will use that it. That is so, so big. I mean, yeah. Dr. Sarah, most of the time we're hearing people, and I've been included in that league, encouraging people to do better than best or, you know, and you're, you're kind of saying don't mess with best, just get there. I mean, that is, is, that, is, is that applicable to just some spaces or, I mean, is that like going to be what we aspire in life is to do? Well, this I, is awesome. This is a whole conversation <laughs> in itself, you know. It is totally. I don't know the answer to does it apply to everything or just certain things, but certainly to um, yeah. I think I think uh, you know I, maybe another advice, but on the same um, theme is just focus on the big rocks, mm -hmm. and that was advice I got from an official like mentor when I was uh, working in corporate America of uh, I was literally saying I'm overwhelmed I had come back from my second maternity leave I'm like I literally can't get through my email if I read every email I don't have enough hours in the day and I can't do this catch up this bad habit stuff I used to do which is go home and work until super late at night or get cut off on the weekend mm -hmm. because now mm -hmm. I've got two kids and one that's so very physically demanding you know and so there's no catch up time so I have to get my work done when I'm at work and I cannot and he basically said, don't even read emails if you're um, CC'd. You do not deserve or you don't have to even, if you're just CC'd and you don't have time. Wait, to wait, that's, that's big. Don't even <laughs> read the email if you're CC'd. Yeah. Like go to the big rock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you need to, um, so you need to drive your agenda. It, you don't let your inbox drive your agenda. You need to decide what are the things you need to get done and go get those things done. It's their responsibility to get your attention if they need a decision from you. So CCing you on an email, that's just if you have time to read it, FYI. That's not asking you a question. That's not telling you you need to know. Like if they need you to know something or they need to, then they need to get that answer from you. So that flipped my world because as a management consultant, I was told you need to respond to every email within 24 hours. That's your obligation to the world, you know? And so <clears throat> having that different frame of reference is like, okay, what are my big things to focus on? And I'm not going to dot every I, cross every T and read every email. Just going to delete, 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 delete. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Deleting is far different from not reading. I thought maybe you were like not reading them now. And maybe when you get a couple of hours, you go back and you check the CCs. You're yes. saying delete, delete, delete. Yes, but I don't delete my deleted folder. So I can go back if all of a sudden something escalates to say, okay. Now, this is theoretical still. I don't necessarily live by that, but it changed my perspective of when I'm a serious time crunch and I'm just triaging, I'm able to now just, you know, 
delete and say if I, if I really if they really need me to get back to them then they'll email me again or whatever <clears throat> so and that's something I really have to do now because I'm just bombarded with um, people looking for you know funding and it's something that we really struggle with frankly because we want to get back to every woman entrepreneur that reaches back to us um, reaches out to us um, and explain if we, you know, are going to pass on the, the investment, why, you know, why it's not a fit for us or when it would be a fit for us or whatever. And so that takes a lot of time and it's hard not to, um, uh, not to lose, you know, let things fall through the cracks. And they have a couple of times. We're pretty darn good, actually. Uh, we have a reputation for being very good about that and getting back to people. But um, anyway, so um, I think that's, that, that was the second, uh -huh. yeah. <clears throat> but your first two kind of tie in together and are so brilliant for this time in particular, because so many people, you know, um, initially, once we knew we were going to be quarantined, started to think about how they could use all that time they never had. And that's not been the evolution for a lot of folks. A lot of folks have really found that they are just tasking in harder, working yeah. longer, and dealing with additional stress and additional requirements that yeah. before were supported by a better infrastructure. I mean, just this morning, they were talking on the news about how um, America is looking for different ports to be able to bring goods into because some of our more dependable and larger ports are congested, you know, by over weeks. And I don't know how much of it is retailers just encouraging us to buy now or not, but the suggestion and the visuals are that we are in a very different time and people are managing a lot differently. When that gets to the granular stage of how do you live at home, you're doing a lot more things now as well. So you may not right. be investing that time on freeways and on airplanes, but you've lost a lot of other things that you're, is that true in your house? Yeah, I, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm very bad about shutting it down. <laughs> so it was easier <laughs> when I, you know, leave work and that yeah. was a physical separation. Also, when I was driving, that's when I talked to my friends and family. So now I'm not driving very much. So I'm not <clears throat> having those conversations and it's hard to prioritize that during the middle, you know, of what feels like the middle of the work day. Um, yeah. Hey, doctor, how old are your kids in the, in the range, in the range of? Um, I've got one in sixth grade and one who's a freshman in high school. So 11 and 14. And so they are old enough then to have a relationship to what the world was like pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And that means that they have some idea or conception about what it can be like to return to pre-COVID opportunities and socialization. Yes. A lot of the women who are in business right now, who I talk with, have much younger kids and they're talking about how their kids won't know how to be different once right. they are back and out. And so right. it's really interesting about your thing about the rock and prioritizing what's really important now in a household with kids, because it's not always about how we manage work, although right. work is a part of how we manage life, isn't it? Yes, totally. Yeah. Well, I'm I know I, I, I know that you're going to be uh, shutting this down in a minute. You got two more to give us. Your advice, right. your advice right. is so strong. We should have just done this conversation <laughs> on your management for life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know one is when I was before I had the idea for the starting this venture capital fund. Um, I read this book called Centered Leadership by Joanne Barsh. Hold it. That's another book. That's my book that I would like to add to my reading list. Actually. Okay. That's amazing. She, um, it's not easy read. Basically she like pulls out of you. What's your unique thing to do in the world and how to go make it happen. She was a senior director at McKinsey for a long time and, um, developed a leadership, um, kind of, uh, training program, um, for women at McKinsey and realized it was relevant for everybody, especially as feminine leadership skills are really what's necessary for 21st century leadership. Anyway, um, 
her advice of um, kind of combined with um, a career coach woman called Renee Trudeau, who is from Austin, but now moved to East Coast, um, of what is your unique thing to do in the world based on your skills, your interests, your experience, your network, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's um, That book is how I sort of developed or created True Wealth Ventures. Um, uh, but really thinking through what energizes me, what drains me, like that whole process of really understanding because there were no mentors that were directly do, you know, you have to see it to be it. There was no seeing it. There was nobody in my world that I wanted to be when I grew up. So I think it took a lot more internal work and, you know, soul searching literally to figure out what I wanted to do. So that's three, or maybe that kind of counts as four. Oh, I know. So um, when I was doing that book, I had to uh, do an exercise where I think I wrote down what I thought was most unique about me and my skills and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and then I was um, on an anniversary vacation with my husband and it said, now you need to go like find somebody to give you feedback on this. And so he was the only person I was with. So I'm like, okay, you know, can you give me feedback on this? And he's like, yeah, I agree with all that, but you did it as a woman. And that's what's really unique. I'm like, no, that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, don't paint me with that brush. Like it doesn't, just cause I'm a woman. He's like, well, but that's what makes it so unusual. You know, that you've done all these things because you're the only woman who's done all that stuff. And I Okay, like I, I really resisted that because I was never in charge of like the women's groups who never went to the women. I, I don't know. And, and so I was resistant to it. And then when it finally like hit me, like, oh my gosh, she's right. That is what's so unique. Then I really embraced it. And really, I was asked to be the executive sponsor of the Global Women's Forum at this big Fortune 500 company I worked at because I was the only woman who was a vice president at the time of like 15,000 employees who had any technical or operational background. And that was very shocking because that's shocking. Um, but what was more shocking is that I had been unaware of it. I was so blind to the fact that I was the only woman. And I think I was sort of resistant to that being any um, advantage or disadvantage, you know? I, so anyway, I think that was really, that was game changing in terms of how I saw the world and made me want to then go help other women. And I guess my, my, my best advice is for those women entrepreneurs or women just in general in business that are listening to this, they're, they are, it's so important that they get a seat at the table because it is so rare, unfortunately, still across so many industries to have women, you know, in, in the, those leadership positions or just even at with a seat at the design table or the management table to they bring a very different perspective that is so valuable and um and that that helped me really change my perspective of my perspective is needed it is valuable it's my obligation to speak up i have a unique you know voice and um and I need to, you know, bring that contribution to, to this decision-making process. So that was Wow, Dr. Sarah Brand, that was a <laughs> mic drop. That was a mic drop. You got to come back. We got to dig in. Just the four for four is going to be so supporting to so many people. And I love that contextually, you're able to keep women in that conversation you're giving conversation to everybody, gender inclusive. I just love that so much. Can hardly wait to read your book. And, <laughs> and, and thank you from my heart to your home. I just thank you so much. You're a busy lady and you've given us a lot today. Thank you. This was such a pleasure. Thank you.